Um, and then there's a couple of things that um, I want to make you all aware of. So firstly, um, I, I pull together the clinical webinars, but we also have a set of research um, webinars for those that are interested. So the next uh, research web series is on Thursday, August 20th. Um, and that's at one, one o'clock UTC. So we always do our meetings um, in UTC. So please bear that in mind um, and work out what that is in your own time zone. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the next clinical um, webinar that we'll be running will be on the 2nd of September. Um, that is always at 1900 UTC, so it's always at the same time. Um, in addition to that, for those of you who um, have worked with SNOMED International and are aware of us before, you'll know that normally we have um, an October meeting which has a business meeting and an expo. Um, normally these move around the world, but for this year, for obvious reasons, I would have thought, um, we're moving to a virtual format. Um, as part of the business meeting, we're going to be running a, I'll call it a clinical day, it's not exactly a day, um, but we'll be running a virtual clinical session um, on the Wednesday, the 7th of October. Um, in terms of what the day will entail, um, we'll start off, so these timings are in UTC, um, as I previously mentioned. So we'll run a session from 1300 to 1500 UTC, which will give a general overview and discussion about clinical engagement, about clinical developments related to SNOMED in general. Between them, between 1530 and 1700 UTC, we have a number of clinical reference groups that will be meeting in parallel. Um, details of those uh, will publish closer to the time um, in terms of Zoom links so people can join. In terms of the clinical reference groups, there are there is membership um, for each of the clinical reference groups, but they're open groups, so anybody is welcome to join as an observer. And then at 1700 to 1730, we'll have a bit of a closing um, plenary, really just to enable feedback from the individual clinical reference groups. So obviously if you're running in parallel, you can't attend all the groups. Um, so it will just give a chance really for each of the groups to report back and um, let the community know what's been going on. So that's in terms of me. Now I'm going to uh, stop presenting and uh, hand over to Ian McNichol. Now, I do believe, Ian, you should be able to um, present from your computer by sharing screen, I do believe. Good, and uh, people should be able to see a nice mountain. Uh, so, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <clears throat> well, I've, just hidden the, I've just hidden the nice mountain behind a my slides which you should be able to see so we're not seeing your slides at all okay just give me a second then let me know if they appear i'm just flicking hmm. from hmm. okay that's strange there should be there should be a green a green button at the bottom saying share screen which if you it was and it, and it was activated and let me just try again that's it ah, excellent okay there you go <laughs> just make sure we've got the right screen which what can you see uh so we can see your uh background and then a an open ehr an open open ehr even towards a coherent connected ecosystem is what we okay just the wrong screen but at least we've got it at least we should now, now we've got a mountain now i can see the mountain. excellent right that's what i wanted because that that meant now when i run you know it should work it's super that's half dome yeah, in yosemite <laughs> okay um good evening good morning everybody uh whatever you are thanks very much um 
Thanks to Snowmed International for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about open EHR or open air. It's the, it's the same thing, just easier to say open air. Uh, bit of background myself, I was a, a GP in, in Clyde Bank in Scotland for 15 years. Uh, the reason I look so young and happy now is that I gave up seeing patients 20 years ago, which has uh, done wonders for my mental and physical health. Since then, I've largely been working as a full-time health informatician. Uh, I'm actually past co-chair. I, I uh, stepped back a few months ago uh, of co-chair of Open Air International, as we're now calling ourselves, and have various other academic and commercial roles, which are not particularly relevant, but they're, they're on the screen for you. Um, a little history, I, I will warn you, I'm going to be a little bit contentious later on, so I'll be quite interested to, to hear what Peter says once he's finished his, his session. I'm looking forward to the discussion at the end. Um, a little bit of background, um, this is where I started my career in 1985. Uh, having finished my GP training, I, I decided to take a year out and spent a year working with a, an application in Scotland called GPASS, which was a GP system, as you might guess, and one of the jobs that I took upon myself at that time was to uh, wander around the UK looking to see what people uh, with other GP systems were doing and came across a chap called Tim Benson uh, and we were looking to upgrade our coding scheme and you'll see the, the blurb in the middle is my report saying that uh, essentially that we should adopt the read codes. Uh, and to cut a long story short, uh, about six months later, uh, the Scottish NHS uh, adopted the read codes, I believe, ahead of any of the other UK administrations. So I guess I had a very small part to play in the, the start of this journey. Um, one of the challenges we always have in describing what open air is about is just to, to, to kind of, we, we do things a little differently and it, it challenges people to understand what we're trying to do. And I guess if we, if we were to ask the goal that I think we would all have, the common goal is we would all like to see a coherent uh, health IT tech system to support patients. So that means it's got to really be patient centered. That's not the whole story, but that would be the fundamental aim. So all the talk about interoperability and data fluidity, it's all about trying to get a coherent system. In reality, what's out there is anything but coherent. I mean, this is a pretty typical subset of a health healthcare community. You could call that local or regional or even national. It's the same kind of fractal mess that we, we've got to deal with. And when people say that health IT is no different from any other IT, they're just wrong. And the, the reason they're wrong is not that there's anything specifically that's different, but we've just got all of this complex mess, particularly around the data. And there are even further subsets of that. There's fur further fractalization. You know, so there's not just surgery as a specialty, but there's urological surgery or cancer urological surgery. And each of these specialties and subspecialties and professions has their own ideas about health data and health information. And these then are reflected in many of the apps that they end up working with. And as I'm sure many of you know, currently a lot of these are hand-built apps. These are, these are what we call feral systems that are built often by... Uh, clinical practitioners like myself, or people with a, a, a keen interest in IT, uh, but they often run in quite significant parts of a, a hospital's IT estate. Oops. Um, one of the questions I started to ask myself is, what do we mean by a system? Because we, we, what we're talking about is getting systems to talk to each other. What do we mean by a system? What, what we normally mean, when I talked about my GP system, I was really talking about my GP application. In other words, the thing that I see and I work with, the user interface, but also the database and also the logical information model, if you like, the, the thought processes, the clinical ideas that go into and sit usually in the programming language sitting behind the, the user interface. And of course, the problem at the moment, in a sense, is that we all have our own individual systems. We have system and system and system and system. And what, what we're trying to do is somehow knit together or create a coherent system from what are multiple often conflicting systems, even though they're supposed to be working with the same patient, with the same kind of data and the same kind of processes. And if you look at something like a cancer journey, this is just, these are very recent screenshots. These are examples from the UK. Um, I'm involved in some work trying to streamline a patient's cancer journey. But right now we have, like, there, there are many, many more applications in this, just a small subset, an MDT review, 
uh, a mid uh, a mid uh, journey treatment summary, you know, often at the end of your know, first chemo uh, end of chemotherapy, for instance, uh, prom scores, uh, end of life care summaries. Uh, all of this stuff should be seamless, and it's just not because we're locking that data into each one of these applications, which is its own system. It's not just the application, it's storing the data and it's thinking about the data. And this is just very, very difficult to, to construct anything coherent when you've got that, that kind of um, uh, situation. Of course, the obvious solution is just let's have one system to rule them all. And you know, I, I suspect many jurisdictions have, have gone down that road. I know Norway is looking at this right now. Uh, a system called Axon. Look, let's just take all the pain away. Let's just essentially procure one system, one supplier. And that certainly is happening at regional level and occasionally at national level. And of course, it's very attractive. It solves the problem in one way, but we know that it, it, solves, it causes all sorts of other problems in terms of vendor lock-in, technology lock-in, all the other problems of monopoly that I think in general uh, people would try to avoid. So of course the solution that is, is currently thought of is, well, we, we, we want interoperability. Um, well, I would say we need interoperability at the moment, but we don't necessarily want it. Um, I, I think interoperability is best seen as, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a response to try to get coherence. It's not, it's not what we need in itself. Um, so right now what happens, if you look at the, the bottom layer, there's a bunch of applications that are being built. There's a conversation between a technologist and a clinician in three different applications, all in the mental health field in the UK. They're all trying to come up with a definition of a bed and they're all coming up with a subtly different definition of a bed. Um, and then someone says, look, this is crazy. We can't move this data between these systems. What we need uh, is some kind of agnostic model, um, an exchange model, something that we can all sign up to. Um, and that's where you get the HL7 kind of series of interoperability, the latest uh, being HL7 Fire. Um, and generally speaking, the models that are arrived at as our interoperability model are somewhat less rich because doing this is hard work. Getting consensus is hard work. So we end up by saying, well, let's just make it 80. You know, 80% is good enough. We don't need to have 100%. 100% lives in each of the applications. But that's not the end of the problem. So somebody, often somebody like me, because I get involved in, in some of the HL7 firework, uh, will be involved in, in building and designing those models, uh, consulting with, with various people around the world. But that's not the end of the story. Um, then someone has to build a transform between each of these bi-directionally in many cases. So whilst HL7 Fire is a huge step forward and to be you know, much applauded, many, many good things. And without a doubt, we need interoperability. We need to work this way at the moment. In open air, we don't think this is going to be the way that things end up we would regard it as, at least in part, a temporary solution to a problem, but one which is not particularly rational. So what's the alternative? Um, the alternative is to think in terms of a platform approach, uh, where instead of there being um, multiple applications, each of which are essentially their own system, they have their own information model and they have their own technology, uh, they have their own uh, database, Let's think of a different way of architecting things where the apps are essentially independent from the data storage and, and the, the information models. And let's construct a world where we maximize the amount of sharing in there and we minimize the amount of dependency on any one technology or certainly any, on any one vendor. But the critical thing is to separate the apps from the data. And we can actually see some of that emerging in the commercial sector. So quite a lot of um, big companies, the Cerners, the Epics, the GP systems, are kind of reinventing themselves as platform companies with the proviso that these are not open platforms. <coughs> People are separating the apps from that data layer, but in, this, in their case, the data layer is proprietary. We want to take that further and make that data layer as open as possible. So one of the key parts of that technology stack is the thing we call a clinical data repository, a CDR, which is essentially a smart data store which natively stores, retrieves, queries, open air data, open air standardized data via a standard API. All of the data in the CDR is completely available, you know, leaving aside governance issues, you know, privacy and security issues. In technical terms, everything that's in the CDR can be accessed, can be queried. 
And critically, when we add new data models to the CDR, there's no re-engineering required. These things are built to be able to respond to us uh, sending up new data models, new allergies models, problems models, uh, end of life care system models, whatever it is, these systems keep, keep running. And we don't have to get a, an engineer to change database tables or uh, re-engineer logical models. It's all hand, handled by the open air ecosystem. Critical part of that, and the bit that's most relevant in the, in the SNOMED world is this idea of a vendor neutral uh, neutral information model. So those of you who are familiar with FIRE will recognize some similarities. But I guess in some ways, we, we some of the, the ways that FIRE works, we kind of got there first, although we do things somewhat differently. Uh, the components of that are a very low level reference model. It's just a very technical layer. It doesn't really have anything clinical in there. It's got things like data types and structures. We have a, a structure we call a composition, which is a document-like object, very similar to what's in, in CBA or, uh, or FIRE, in fact. Uh, but most of our clinical information, most of our clinical models, we put in another layer we call archetypes. And these are managed quite independently and separately by people like me, by clinicians and clin clinical informaticians. And the whole ecosystem is designed to let us work on these individual components. So the final part of the, of the information model stack in OpenAir is templates. So that's where we take these individual components and we combine them to uh, create, if you like, real world use cases. So the, what you can see on the right is a visualization of a cancer MDT report. Um, you can see the WHO performance status archetype, and then it is used in the context of this cancer MDT output report but it can be used in many other templates and cross-queried. So the fact that it's in this particular document doesn't mean that it's locked into that. So I can say, look, just give me all the WHO performance status reports for this patient, no matter where it was collected, why it was collected. We need that kind of granular querying and it's, it's all fed by, by the system. So just a little more on these archetypes and templates. Um, Here's a little app. So obviously quite often what we're doing is sitting these data models underneath actual applications. Um, so if we think about this diabetic checkup app, it's going to be used using a bunch of components, issue, weight, blood pressure, HbA1c, and assessment. Well, we can use the same archetypes uh, that we're using in the, the diabetic checkup template. We can also use them for a cardiology clinic template, and they are cross-queryable. Now, just to be clear, the templates, although they sometimes look a little bit like user interfaces, are not. They're not the applications. These archetypes and templates are application independent. In fact, OpenAir doesn't have any applications officially. Sometimes people get confused and think that OpenAir is, if you let like, an open source application, something like, uh, like um, OpenMRS. Uh, you know, there, there are a number of open source uh, you know, EHR products around the world. That's not what OpenEHR does. It's very much about the data layer. We leave it to other people to build applications on top of the data layer. My world uh, and the world of my colleagues on the clinical side is very much about tooling. So we use uh, specific tooling to create these archetypes and templates. Uh, what you can see on the left is the uh, OpenAir archetype designer, which is provided by a company called Better. Uh, and that's free to sign up and use. You're very welcome to do so. Uh, I managed to get my labels the wrong, way, the wrong way around, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. Um, the other tool on the right uh, is a very interesting product that I was, uh, I used to work for the company that, that built it. Uh, it's built by a company called Ocean Informatics. And we use that at much larger scale. So that's used for our conversations. It's used for us to review the archetypes internationally. Um, so we have a thriving team who work through suggested archetypes, usually supplied by um, uh, individuals or companies to say, look, can you add this to the international library? So it acts as a library, but most importantly, it acts as a, as a very um, uh, effective review tool. Because what's most important in this space is that we get clinicians and clinical informaticians to comment on these models. One of the things about our world which is perhaps a little bit different from at least part of the SNOMED world, is that we're very much in the, the business of the clinical records and the context. And that's much less based on science. You know, it's not based on physiology or biology or therapeutics. It's based on what people do in their jobs. And so that becomes much more cultural and nuanced. 
uh, and it requires discussion. So we can't have standardization by very, very smart people deciding what a pulse oximetry should look like. It requires people working on the ground to say, no, hang on, you know, we need pre post ductal um, uh, status to record the things that we want. I don't even know what that is. Um, but these, these are the kind of feedback. You'll also see there's a lot of data points in there for something as simple as pulse oximetry. And that's a deliberate um, design decision. We call it the maximal data set. When we're designing these things, we deliberately say, look, if it applies to pulse oximetry and it sounds reasonable, it's in. Um, we use the templates to take things back out again. So, you know, as a GP, I doubt very much I'd be doing any pre or post doctoral um, uh, pulse oximetry. I just want the SPO2. So, in any template that would be built for me as a GP, we would what we call constrain out all these other data points. They wouldn't be relevant to my data set. So, where's this been used? Um, it's a slow burn. It's a complex technology to, to build, particularly the CDRs and the tooling, but we are there now. We've got multiple CDRs uh, suppliers, um, open and closed source, and we're starting to see some real progress around the world. This is one that I'm obviously interested in as a, as a, as a Scot. So NHS Scotland has adopted OpenHR as part of their national digital platform, very much with that, this idea that increasingly uh, they will be asking application developers to talk to the platform as their single source of truth for uh, most of the data. Now, this will be a long, slow burn. It won't happen immediately, but that's very much the direction of travel. Um, there's another group of, um, and we've got other places, uh, you know, Lycra type, sorry, regional health exchanges using OpenEHR. I'll show you some examples in a minute. But the other group of um, people that are interested in using this technology are just some, if you like, traditional uh, health system vendors who you know, end up with this kind of um, problem in their engineering. Very, very complex data. Trying to do that uh, with traditional re relational databases gets increasingly difficult to hold together. So quite a number of um, companies are now just using OpenAir as a better technology for building their own app data storage layers. These are just some of the apps that I've been involved in building. Um, very rich e-prescribing system, uh, a large registry project for patients with cancer and rare, rare diseases. Uh, the whole of the city of Moscow is running on open air, so that's all of their primary care systems, outpatient systems, um, GP system in Norway, uh, health uh, hospital systems in Norway, and a hospital system in Finland. And there's and also Una is the um, Finnish national uh, record project. We also had a lot of um, interesting time with COVID-19. So one of the things we can do with open air is react very quickly because these data models, we are building them uh, as clinicians. We can get the requirements very quickly, work them up, get the templates built and get them into applications and the applications built very quickly. So we had a real flurry of activity around COVID-19 when it hit. So uh, an international project collaborating on the data models, applications in Norway, the UK, um, GP system in Norway, um, uh, also in Italy. The most interesting perhaps the one in the bottom right, uh, which is a project in China. So there's a fairly uh, decent open air community in China and they did a lot of work. They, they mentioned their archetypes, they used 120 archetypes. I understand these were all archetypes that they took from CKM, so they didn't have to develop anything new. They built a decision support system based on the emerging uh, information they were getting from obviously the, the, the early phases of the, of the pandemic. Uh, I should say there's a, a, a clip there, um, uh, sorry, a link there that's got uh, a number of people, including myself, talking about the COVID-19 work. We're not the only crazy people. Uh, Ernst and Young have recently uh, issued this, this uh, very good report, which really highlights the idea of having data, rep uh, data repositories independent from the, from the apps in the ecosystem. But this will play alongside uh, legacy systems. You know, this, this is not a, you know, a, a sudden big bang replace of stuff that's there already. We need, there's a lot of good systems out there and we'll need them for a while and we'll need technologies like HL75 and whatever comes next to connect these up for some time to come. But we think it's now time to start making that, those steps to change the way that we wire the health IT system. So now more specifically on to terminology. So we build the models and the models are really what you see on the left. So on the left, this is an adverse reaction risk model. This is our allergy model. 
And those of you who know the fire allergy and tolerance model will, will notice that it's almost identical. And that's because we worked with the um, HL7 fire guys to jointly model that and use that CKM tool to do our reviews. Uh, where does where does some um, terminology and in particular SNOMED fit really, really well? It fits really well in a number of places. So obviously, what's the name of the substance? What were you allergic to? In this case, salicylate allergy. Uh, you could argue that should be the substance rather than the allergy, but we'll maybe get into that in the, in the discussion. Uh, what was the manifestation? What happened? I was vomiting. Again, that's an absolute um, shoe in for a rich reference terminology and SNOMED CT is really the only game in town for doing that sort of thing. So these are the easy ones, and that's where I think we should be concentrating most of our efforts. And, you know, it's a no-brainer that where uh, people are licensed to use SNOMED CT around the world, we would be expecting them to use archetypes and, and uh, archetypes templates and, and SNOMED CT in that way. But then if we move through the same information model, um, the same uh, allergy model, there are one or two places where you think, well, it, it might make sense to use SNOMED. So for instance, we've got status. Is it suspected, likely confirmed, resolved or refuted? We've also got category, immune mediated, non-immune mediated, indeterminate. Yep, we could certainly, I, I haven't checked, I suspect quite a number of these codes are actually available. I know that some of the categories came from uh, a, a GP system in the UK, which would have been recoded and therefore almost certainly there are SNOMED codes available for that. The question is, does it really add value? Um, you know, uh, and again, if you look at the, um, at the fire equivalents, uh, they're using their internal value sets with essentially their internal code systems to handle that. And I think that's an open question. I think there are places where it does make sense to use um, a reference terminology like SNOMED, but not always. And it's hard work. It's hard work to line these things up. Obviously, it adds another, uh, another delay, if you like, to the delivery mechanism. That's not always a bad thing, but it's another, it's another piece of work to be done. So right now, we would, we would tend to mostly model these, these kinds of little value sets internally using what we call uh, internal codes, but they're structurally, uh, structurally similar to the, the little internal value sets that the fire guys would use. So again, not saying you shouldn't use SNOMED and certainly some people would want to, and very often we will leave the option for people to ignore our, our internal sets and allow them to use uh, other terminologies, SNOMED being a common one, if it makes sense in their locality. So that's, uh, I think, a great area. Uh, and one where I think it, we can make sensible decisions. Uh, I managed to miss the last slide. Um, I meant to just mention other areas where um, some people would, would then so no, look, we, we, we're a snowmed country, we should be putting snowmed labels and everything. Let's, where it says substance and status and criticality, we, we, we should have snowmeds for these things, for the names of the nodes. Now, we can actually do that uh, in the sense we can bind terminologies to, to the, the node names in our archetypes. That's certainly possible, and we sometimes do it. We particularly do it for observables like blood pressures and, and pulses and whatever. The question is, is it worth it? Um, it's, these things are already internally coded and queryable. They're obviously not queryable by a full, uh, sorry, a full SNOMED uh, enabled system. But in our world, we can query between open air and, uh, and SNOMED quite easily. So again, there are places where this is worthwhile, and we certainly do it, but I would question whether it's really worth the effort. There was a lot of uh, research when in 10, 15 years ago, uh, around the time of the UK national, uh, the national program, the, the big project that, that blew about 12, pound, 12 billion pounds. And you know, it turns out to be quite difficult. It's quite demanding of time. It's demanding of terminology skills. And I'm not sure that it often, you, you get the value back. There are places where you should be labeling these things as SNOMED, but as a bulk, let's put SNOMED labels on all of these things, probably not a great idea. Here's just an example of how we mix and match between our, what we call archetype query language. So this is a, a logical query language uh, that understands the data models that are in there and lets us query the data without having to know the actual physical data structures. So somewhere in an open air system, there will be some kind of database and it will have tables or the equivalent in, in MongoDB or, or graph databases. But we use this as a logical querying string 
we send that to the CDR and it interprets it and it does its own querying behind the, behind the hood. So in order to query an open air system, no matter who provides the CDR or what the, the underlying technology is, the query should still work. And we've now got it working uh, it's where we can pass through our kind of matches statements. In other words, in this case, there's a very simple query, which is looking for patients uh, with particular gender codes. Um, and it's using a terminology expression in the context of this uh, matches statement here. And then the interesting thing here is we're passing that through to uh, an HL7 fire value set. Um, and we think that's going to be a really powerful combination. For us, the value set has really opened things up. We were actually able to do this querying probably 15 years ago. Ocean Informatics made, made this work very nicely. But they had it working with their own terminology server. And the problem we've always had in the open air world was having a vendor neutral way of querying into you know, sophisticated terminology services like Auto Server or the, the Snowman International equivalent. And we think the, the fire value set. Uh, a resource is a really powerful tool both for providing that facade but also helping us manage little terminology subsets like this you know little lists of genders which we should probably never go into uh, you know a, a reference terminology like like snowmed um, but are ubiquitous you know we need lots of these things so this is a we think is a real breakthrough this is a real example from um, the airbase uh, organizations this open source uh, german outfit So this is where I get a little bit contentious. Um, be interested in reactions later on. Um, so we have some problems when we're talking about, not actually just about, about open air. Um, I would say this also applies in some of the, the, the broader conversations we have. And it's, you know, and I'm not having a go at the terminology community. It's very often the message that finds its way into national program boards. And very often we get a message back saying, you know, you know SNOMED is our lingua franca. Um, and we find that people want to push the boundaries. They want to do those marginal things that I showed you in the earlier screens, like, yeah, sure, we use, we use SNOMED to, to, to carry the substance, but yeah, now we want to use SNOMED for all of those value sets. And now we want to label the things with, uh, label the, the node names with SNOMED. And it really is not, in my mind, and I think a lot of people are starting to agree, it's really not the best way to use these different complex but powerful technologies. Um, you know, and the same kind of mindset is this is all about building ontologies. And, you know, I've been involved in far too many ontology meetings um, where people, you know, it's really powerful ideas and powerful, powerful technologies, but I think are being applied in the wrong place. Um, again, applied in, in our side of the world is in our side of the problem, I guess, building the structures and the kind of concepts is often much more um, cultural, it's much more nuanced. And ontology is not a great way of doing that. Ontology is great for the real world definitions, you know, uh, relationships between uh, therapeutics, relationships between drugs and diseases, that sort of thing. Uh, putting it into our side of things is is we think is not a good way of doing it. Having fire coming along and being so successful has been very helpful because I think it's, it, it, I would guess the fire community takes a broadly similar view. And I think even I've noticed some discussions within, within the SNOMED CT circles that others are coming around to these ideas that let's stick to our strengths and then we'll make more rapid progress. Now, there may be a far future where the ontological world does come to the fore. Uh, you can see the ideas are in there, but I think it's too early to try to apply them across the board and we're just going to lose momentum. Most importantly, for people who are trying to make decisions uh, in terms of procurements and what standards to, um, uh, to use, it's really important that they get a nuanced view and don't just think that uh, we, we've got SNOMED, that's fine. It's all sorted. Uh, all our interoperability and all our standardization efforts are, are, are away. It's a critical part of the story. Um, so it's just some uh, images on the, on the, the right, um, the famous paper from Jimino uh, Desiderata, uh, who nicely outlines those two bits. There's the, what he calls the controlled medical vocabulary, and the bottom, the electronic medical record. And I guess that's, our, that's what we're trying to do. The two things absolutely interact. Um, 
and the other you know, great piece uh, and great thinking in this area was, was Alan Rector at the University of Manchester. And I wanted to use his propeller slide bottom right, but also his headline for a project that kind of preceded Snowman called Galen, um, which he, he, he called the strapline was making the impossible very difficult, which I think we should all, uh, all uh, take on board. So just as an example of where I think this kind of tension is being played out in the real world. So I've been involved in a project in the UK called Interopen, which is largely about taking fire resources, uh, the international fire resources, and trying to apply them in the UK. Obviously, UK is a snowmed country, uh, and so a lot of snowmed uh, use, maximising snowmed use. But we've, we've come across this problem, which has been discussed a couple of times, in fact, inside the vaccination resource, um, obviously you're going to record the vaccine code, what was the product that was administered. But there's a, there's a data point in the fire resource and in the open air archetype there is an equivalent to say this wasn't given. The kid didn't get their MMR vaccine because they were feverish, so we had to send them away again. And this is just a Boolean data point, it's actually a mandatory Boolean data point that sits alongside the vaccine code. So the, the, the discussion which has just come up, and I've um, anonymized it all so that there's no names, uh, and no embarrassment about who's saying what. Um, the discussion was, well, look, we can, and maybe we should carry all of the meaning of this vaccine code was not given inside the vaccine code itself, because we can do that. We can use a vaccination procedure code and we can add a, a, a situation not, not done uh, and essentially post-coordinate that or it may be it may be constructed as a pre-coordinated code but essentially all of the meaning is carried in the vaccine code and of course that's very attractive in some ways uh, there are issues about people querying across different nodes you know it might be possible for somebody to say give me all the patients who've had an MMR but they forget to query for those that are not given so there are some attractions in that and certainly for people, you know, the GP systems in the UK are very used to, to using those kind of pre-coordinated terms. However, um, the consensus has been that we should go for the, the, set, the second option, which is to distribute the meaning between the information model and, and SNOMED CT, just to carry the vaccine vaccination procedure, um, then to use that flag and to make sure that people use it properly when they're creating the system and passing data. And then, of course, to use SNOMED for things like generally unwell the finding. And I think that's the right thing. This is contentious. This kind of discussion has gone on for the whole time I've been involved in open air, which is 15 years. But I think we're starting to see the appetite in industry is actually to go for this. And we'll make quicker progress, although we will need to be careful, than if we try to go down the more complex avenues that SNOMED CT can apply. Maybe we'll do so in the future, but I don't think the timing is, is right at the moment. So just finishing off now, um, where are the next steps? So the free set, great. It's really good. We have a problem as a, an international organization that, of course, we cannot assume that the people who are going to be using our archetypes and templates are SNOMED licensed. Uh, so therefore, whilst we can, with SNOMED uh, International's permission, we can uh, bind SNOMED codes to our models, we can't make them a, a firm dependency. Now, I know the FAR guys have, done some, have had some discussions to make that a possibility, and we may well, well go down the same road, but fundamentally that's a problem for us. So the emergence of the free sets, I hope, is a sign that the whole licensing model is going to gradually open up a lot more because I think that would actually help SNOMED's cause a great deal. And I, I would hope that we could start to build on the, the, sort of, uh, the, the, the GPS, I've called it IPS because I was thinking the International Patient Summary, the, the uh, I think is it generic patient set or global, global patient set and the recent COVID-19 free sets, I think are a great idea. And I would like to have further discussions possibly in concert with the, the HL7 FAR guys around whether we can extend those ideas where you know, it's, it's well within SNOMED International's comfort zone in terms, in terms of their business model and need, of course, to, to fund their activity. So a few suggestions there. Um, that's much more in the, if you like, the, the commercial setting. Um, further next steps, I think we need to get this message over that terminology and ontology cannot solve right now all of the issues that we have. But we actually do have, I think, an emerging set of tools and technologies that actually can work very nicely together and start to real, 
you know, get make real inroads into this very challenging area of how we standardise the representation of medical records. So NOMED CT, FIRE and Open Air. I've not mentioned things like XDS, which I think is also a very valuable uh, tool, but sits somewhere, somewhere over in the, the, the document, document metadata. Um, there is good work happening and, you know, and we, we're likely to want to get more involved ourselves, but you know, we, we would very much pick up on the, the SNOMED uh, International and Firework around vital signs, for instance, and that's very valuable. So as an example of that, um, in, a, in a country not terribly far from, from here, uh, there was a, 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 a very local and firm discussion about how uh, open air archetypes should be labelled in terms of things like systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Uh, and I thought the, the, the guidance they were, they were being getting from people who called themselves snowman experts, and, and they may have been, but it really didn't sound sensible to me at all. Um, so it's very good to be able to point to the authoritative guidance that's on both the SNOMED website and the, the FIRE websites about how you should bind FIRE observations to the various vital signs like pulse oximetry and um, uh, blood pressure, etc. Okay, so that's me, uh, a whistle stop tour. Um, looking forward to the questions later on. We're a very friendly community and we like beer. So if you want to join us, uh, it's free to access all of the resources. Uh, if you want to become a formal member as an individual, it only costs you 15 euros a year. But most of our support comes from companies and, uh, and international organizations. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to hearing what Peter has to say mm. and to having some discussions later. So thank you, Ian. Um, I definitely like the sound of plenty of beer, but that's just me. <laughs> um, so I have one question for you, which will be quickly from Jasara. So Jasara, I've unmuted you, so please ask your question. I think she's dropped off. Uh, she's still showing. Oh right, okay. I, I I did have a question. I have a, a lot of, lot of questions, but I, I want I just wanted to 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 bring to Ian, the, the old friend of mine. I have a lot of questions, but just, I don't I don't know if it's the timing now. Okay, thank you for okay. that. Okay. Thanks. Speak to you later. No problem. Okay. Right. In which case, then uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Peter. So Peter Hendler. Um, he's going to okay, you can uh, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Uh, okay. Sharing your screen. <clears throat> so here we go. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm going to start, I'm not going to introduce myself or give my background because I don't think there's enough time. I'm going to say that in the evolution of uh, computer science from the very beginning, there has always been the user interface and then a middle layer, which is usually called business logic, and then the bottom layer, which is the data store. And that's where the data lives even when the computer is turned off. It's, uh, how, the, it's how the data is stored on the hard disks. In the beginning, uh, uh, all of the data for every program was what the programmer made for that particular program. So every single program had its own file type. Uh, there was a very big difference. Uh, oh, what is this? Oh, I'm getting a, a spam call. Okay, I'm still here, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next thing, which was a real big thing in the 1980s, was when they developed the relational database systems. And that's still the maximum, or I'll say the majority of systems are living on top of that. And then the next thing that came along, and, uh, and, and this is what almost everything is now, including open air, is it's related to object oriented where you have um, tree like structures um, and you and I won't get into the details of that because I don't think there's enough time. But a thing, a, a next thing which has not caught on in a big way in but it is it, it is 
going up exponentially now is the idea of um, of of directed graphs and relationships and description logic and the web ontology language is uh, one manifestation of that of the of the uh, open of what do they call it? The semantic web. That's the word I'm thinking of. Now, SNOMED was actually getting invented at about the same time as these ideas were becoming popular and long before uh, the web ontology language. And uh, Ian Horrocks at Oxford, among others, but he was like the main guy, uh, by the time OWL became a thing, it was recognized that SNOMED had pre-existed was a flavor of Al. Now, this is an entirely different way of thinking than tree-like structures. And so I'm going to give a short slideshow, and then I'm gonna do a live demo, and I'm going to use these type of uh, relationships, these type of semantic networks, which are a different way of thinking and a different way of thinking about how data is stored different than object oriented, different than street tree structure, different than XML, different than JSON, different than fire. Although you can use fire and JSON and XML to load these things. And one name for them is RDF stores, which just stands for uh, resource definition framework. But you don't have to know that I'm going to try and explain it in my, um, Let's see, slideshow. Why is it not letting me? Okay. Do slide, I want to start my, huh? Do slideshow. Go to the left and just do from the beginning. No, to the left. There we go. So. Okay. Yeah, got it. All right. So this circle represents a thought, and it can be a thought about anything in the universe. It could be a cat, it could be a proton, it could be um, heat, it could be radiation, it could be anything. Now, we can think of anything. And the first thing we do in this, um, this type of modeling data is, because people in different countries speak different languages, we don't want to give it a name of words. We want to give it a meaningless um, code, which is unique to this thought, and will be a universal way of referring to this thought, whatever the heck it is. And it will never, it's a number that has never been used for any other thought, and it can never be used for any thought if this thought is retired from SNOMED or whatever, we're never allowed to use this again. So it's a once in a lifetime universal code. And so SNOMED codes that go to concepts are used once only, and they're the universal way of uh, communicating what that thought is, even though you may have many different ways of saying it with words in different languages. But the definitions, unlike ICD, where you just have a code and then you have a sentence of words, the definition has nothing to do with the words. The words are just so humans can talk about it. But the, so the words are for convenience, but they do not define the term. Now, when you talk about a concept, we're talking about the top of this triangle. In other words, the SNOMED um, terms are about thoughts. And the SNOMED codes and the SNOMED words are symbols that symbolize or point to the thought. Now, in the real world, there is a referent. But the referent, you can never truly know. So in other words, um, you can talk about diabetes and we have an idea of what diabetes is and we share that idea of what diabetes is. But diabetes in the real world, beyond all the science that we know, has things about it that we can't fully know. So there's the real thing in the real world, which is the referent. There's the thought, which we must communicate to each other. And one way that we 
uh, communicate that thought is through the symbol, which would be the words and the code. Now let's take this thought and let's connect it to some other snowman thoughts by relationships. So let's say that this thought is a clinical disorder. And you'll notice that clinical disorder is also a thought, a snowman concept, and it has its own number. And the word disorder doesn't really define it. That's just so that we humans can talk about it and, you know, make conversations and understand it in our own minds. And there's another snowman linking concept called finding sight. And we link um, this thought that we're defining to lung structure and the word structure in snowman is an interesting word because you can have the left lung the right lung the left middle lobe you can have the bronchioles you can have the alveoli but when you put the word structure what that means is anything that has to do with the lung anything so it's like that's what structure means and then we have a pathological process which goes to another snowman term called infectious process now, think about this thought and how we've constrained it by relationships to other concepts. So, this is a clinical disorder that is infectious and affects any part of the lung. Okay, that sounds like a really good definition for a lung infection. So, now we can give it words. The words do not define its meaning. The words are just for us, and these happen to be English words. They could, if you're French or Chinese, you could have different words, but the words we'll call it, will say that its fully specified name is infectious disease of lung, and then parentheses disorder to show that its parent is, that its ultimate parent, its uh, top parent is disorder. And it can also have a preferred name, which is infectious disease of lung, but we can give it synonyms like lung infection and pulmonary infection. Now, sometimes you want to find all of the patients that have a particular kind of condition, but there is no SNOMED term for that condition. So an example of this is autoimmune arthritis. There is no such term in SNOMED for autoimmune arthritis. So because we're using this new way of dealing with data, we can do what's called a subsumption query and we can define what's called an anonymous query or an, we make a temporary anonymous thought that will never have a name and it will never have a code. But the reasoners that work in SNOMED are still able, as if it existed, to show us all of the existing SNOMED terms that would meet this definition. So let's say that we have a thought, which we'll call a query, that is a kind of clinical disorder that has associated morphology inflammation and affects joint structure, which means all the joints, any of the joints, any parts of any of the joints, any combination of anything that has to do with joints, cartilage, um, ligaments, anything. Okay, synovial tissue and a pathological process of autoimmune, which is a child of disordered immunity. This query, which we can actually do live on our tool and actually find patients immediately, even no matter how many millions of patients we have, um, this is what a SNOMED query would look like, and we're going to do something like this live. Now, if you go back here, you'll notice that we have circles that are connected by lines. And every time we have a circle connected by a line, that's called a triplet. And we can break them down. And the official name is subject, predicate, object, means what you're connecting. And the predicate is what you're, the, you connect the subject to the object through the predicate. And an example is lung infection is a, that's the predicate disorder. And lung infection has finding site lung structure. Now, the reason this is important is you can take the most complex um, graphs 
including all of SNOMED, which if you were to draw it out in this scale would probably take up a whole football field, but you can break it down into these little triplet molecules and put them all in a pot, which is called an RDF store. And there are many RDF stores that are for free or commercial. And you will be able to do the logic based on the triplets. Now, in the previous talk, you heard that there's SNOMED, which is uh, now, uh, basically when you ask a question, you, you know, you have what, where, when, who, and why. Now, SNOMED is only the what. But the where, in other words, a given hospital with a given address would be in the medical record system. SNOMED's never going to have a SNOMED term for a specific hospital or doctor's office. Or there could be a patient named John Doe that has a medical record number. There's never going to be a SNOMED term for John Doe or for his medical record number. That belongs in the EHR. And uh, John Doe may have had an outpatient visit. And that visit would have occurred at a specific place at a specific time. It had a specific doctor and a specific uh, receptionist that uh, that logged him in uh, and they would have a specific phone number. But that doesn't go into SNOMED. What goes into SNOMED is only uh, the what. So let's say that we have a patient who also through a triplet, but this is not SNOMED, this is a triplet that has to do with what's called the clinical data, has a medical record number of 4675. And that patient at a given date had an, out, had an encounter, which was an outpatient visit. And there's a whole lot of data about the outpatient visit, which includes the doctor and uh, all kinds of how much he was charged and stuff like that. But for just for to make things simple, I'm only going to care about the diagnosis, which was a lung infection, which once it goes to lung infection, now we're connected through this diagnosis link into SNOMED. And so this line here, diagnosis between outpatient visit, which is in the EHR to lung infection, is where it goes connected to SNOMED. And if you um, look at this logic, you can even simplify it for the sake of if you want to find all of the patient's medical record numbers and count them that had a lung infection, you could actually simplify it to this. So now let's escape here and let me find my live data. Okay, SNOMED International, is this it? No, I'm trying to find where I have my, um, here it is. Okay, so this is a live tool where we have uh, uh, one and a quarter million patients. And I probably don't have enough time to do both scenarios. So I'm going to say one scenario and not do it. And then I'm going to do the um, COVID scenario just because if I have time for one, I'll do the uh, COVID scenario. Now, I'm a rheumatologist. And when you learn rheumatology, you learn that there are autoimmune arthritis. And one of them is uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And the immune system can uh, damage the joints and the lungs and the blood vessels and a lot of things. But as it damages the joints, it causes pain, swelling, redness, heat, and destruction of the joints. And it's uh, caused by the immune system. And there are certain drugs that inhibit inflammation, but they often don't work. And then you have to go to a biological drug like a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor monoclonal antibody and that will inhibit the immune system not enough that you will instantly die of infection or cancer, but at a, to an intermediate range where you will be more prone to cancer, perhaps, probably, maybe not cancer, but definitely more prone to infections. But it will turn down the immune system enough that your rheumatoid arthritis will make a dramatic improvement and it will protect your joints. So that's very simple. Now you're very happy 
patient comes in, has rheumatoid arthritis, you give them a TNF agent, they get better, and you get away with it, and it's wonderful. There are other diseases that are common, like chronic lung disease. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is an example. When you, that when you get from too much smoking, damage in the lung, you can't uh, clear your secretions, and you're more prone to bacterial pneumonia, which can kill you, of course. Now, that's very good. Okay, so you, you just watch their lungs, protect them from infections. Uh, you know, if they get a fever, you check them out, maybe put them on antibiotics. But in real life, I had people walk in my office that were doing terrible with the rheumatoid arthritis, had failed all the agents, and guess what? They happen to have COPD or a chronic lung disease. So now I'm really in a terrible place because they're already prone to getting a lung infection, but their arthritis is making them wish they weren't alive. So I could give them a TNF agent and make their arthritis better, but then I'm putting that, them at an even more ridiculous risk for bacterial pneumonia. So in this scenario, which I'm not going to do, I do have a definition of anything that's a disease with finding site joint structure, associated morphology, inflammation, and pathological process, abnormal immune process. That would get rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and all those things that you can treat with TNF agents. And then I could also say, and also give me the patients that have a disease with clinical course chronic, and these are triples, okay? So this is, give me a patient where circle is connected to is a disease and is connected by clinical course to chronic, just like I showed you on those slides, and is connected by finding site to lung structure, and that will be all chronic lungs disease, and then I'll get a certain subset of my patients, and then I could say, let's divide them into those who have or have not had, this is a SNOMED term, a product containing tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor, and then finally, I want to find out of those two subsets, how many got a disease of finding site lung structure with causative agent bacteria? And in this way, I find out how much extra risk and how, what's the ratio of risk with and without the um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease to giving a TNF inhibitor and how many times worse is the risk ratio? Um, if we have time at the end, I'll do that. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a COVID thing. Now, COVID, um, the, the uh, COVID, we, we happen to know that obesity, diabetes, and hypertension seem to increase the risk of getting pneumonia and dying. So we can define using SNOMED, certain things like we could say COVID detected is um, the detection of, and this is the official name of the virus, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two detected. Now, um, in order to define, and this is hard to remember, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two, Maybe if I just remember coronavirus 2, that'll be good enough. So I'm going to make a new subset. And I'm going to make it for corona COVID pneumonia. So I'm going to just put an X here. And that it, uh, this is an arbitrary name. And the reason I'm putting an X is just so that we can find it later in my talk. And I'm going to call it COVID pneumonia. And I'm going to say that I want to look, and this is again, starting with that anything in the universe idea, I want to look for something which, first of all, is a disease. And I want it to have a finding site, and this is not a slideshow, this is live, going into uh, one and a quarter million patients of data. 
boy, it's taking long. And this is very scary that it's taking long. In fact, we may have to go to plan B. Uh, we have one server that runs this in the whole world. And so if somebody else is using it, all right, this is not good. I did read, I already built this before, and this is what it looks like. Disease, finding site, lung structure, causative agent, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and associated morphology, inflammatory morphology. So any idea, which is a clinical disease of the lung caused by the COVID-19 causative agent, who causes inflammation in the lung is COVID pneumonia. That's, I made that up. I mean, that's just using logic. And what I want to do now is I want to go to the, what happened? Oh my. Uh, Eon, you are alive, right? Let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, going to cohorts, I was going to have to turn it over to you. Okay, let's say that we want to find all of the patients that have COVID detected. Now, I have to tell you that our one and a quarter million patients are synthetic patients that um, I created with um, Java program with probabilities and stuff, and we'll come out with reasonable numbers, but they're not real data. This is just to show you. You can fill these data with fire actual data. So if you have real patients, you can feed them to us in fire. We can put them in this data store and we can run this. But let's say how many patients have had COVID detected? Okay. So it actually did this, and we have uh, 272,000 patients with COVID detected. Now I'm going to add a clause, and now I want to know, start it, starting with COVID detected, how many now get COVID pneumonia? Okay, now we have 85.7 thousand. So what I do is uh, round it up to 85.8 because it's 7.9. Okay, so 85.8 divided by 272.5 from our previous slide gives us that without considering those with complications, but taking all comers, about 31.5% of patients who have COVID detected will ultimately develop COVID pneumonia. Now I'm going to replace COVID pneumonia. I'm going to add diabetes, diabetes mellitus. This is a pre-existing SNOMED term. And I'm going to fetch the cohort. And now this is our new denominator. In our population, 124.3 thousand have had COVID detected and had um, diabetes mellitus. Now I'm gonna add a clause, and of those, I wanna get the numerator, how many had COVID pneumonia? And we'll fetch the cohort. And this is live, it's actually doing the database. Okay, 53.8. So 53.8 divided by the previous number of 124.3 gives you 43.3%. So what we've just done, and this could be if you had a medical uh, record system and you had a million and a quarter patients and you wanted to know how um, diabetes affected your COVID patients, you would see that by adding diabetes, the risk of developing pneumonia from COVID detected goes up from 31.5% to 
to 43.3%. Now let's do another thing. Let's add a new complication. Let's add obesity. So we're going to get a new denominator. So here's obesity disorder. And our new denominator, this is our patients that have COVID detected and diabetes mellitus and obesity. So now we have 61.8%. How many of those got COVID pneumonia? So we add a clause and we say COVID pneumonia. And remember, this COVID pneumonia is not, um, I'm not using a snowman term. I'm actually using the query that I built in the previous slot, in the previous tab, in the subsets tab. And now searching the database, and this is searching through the triplets. Okay, now we have 30.6. So 30.6 divided by 61.8 is 49.5%. So by adding obesity to the diabetes, we go from 43.3% to 49.5%. Now, nobody really knows because nobody gave me a, a one and a quarter million real patients to do this on. So I am doing this on synthetic data, but you could just see how quickly within minutes we're able to do this complex research using, um, using this kind of logic. Finally, I'm going to add hypertension. And I'm gonna fetch the cohort. This is my last denominator. Okay, 30.9, and uh, let me now add the pneumonia to that. Here we go. Okay, 17.4. So 17.4 divided by 30.9 is 56.3%. Uh, so if you have all three comorbidities compared to our having no comorbidities specified, which means the whole population, 31.5% goes up to 56.3%. Now, as you see here, I've done a whole bunch of complex clinical research in literally minutes, and I could take away obesity. Um, our, we're working on this tool because this does not work right now, but you see how it has patient has not had. So what if I wanted to know, for example, if they had hypertension and diabetes, but not obesity, I can't do that right now just because this is a brand new tool and it's, it's beta and it still has glitches. Um, but I just wanted to show how easy it is to combine the clinical data, which is the patient's medical record number, the patient's sex. Uh, you know, I'm not caring about certain things here, like I don't care what the doctor's name was in this particular research that I'm doing. So I didn't extract that. But then connected to the SNOMED, putting it all into SNOMED-like logic, and then using the reasoner and the search engine, I can do this research on a million and a quarter patients and get like realistic, um, if it were real data, I would get the real numbers. But in this demo, it's good enough for you to see how easy it is to do this. Um, we're working on an industrial strength tool, which will look like this, but will underneath the, the um, you know, in the business logic, will be able to work and be loaded with any fire bundle of patient data. It, I, I don't know what month that'll be ready, but when it is, it'll be open source. And then if you wanted to do this kind of research, all you would have to do is download and install our system. Then you would, have to take whatever your proprietary EHR's data form is and convert it to FHIR 
and then you would be able to then our um, tool here would be able to consume that fire clinical data, put it in the pot. Um, our tool here goes into a SNOMED um, terminology server, and there's enough information there to actually be able to think of whatever of these questions you want. Now, um, I will ask Ian, depending on how our time is, whether you wanted me to do that uh, rheumatology demo or, or stop here. So I'll turn it back to Ian. So Peter, in the interest of time, uh, we'll stop here because uh, we've got a couple of questions um, coming. So, so thank you very much. Um, so I'll start with I'll start with the questions that we have in the chat window. But um, if there are any other questions as we go, please type them in the chat window or raise your hand, whichever. <laughs> um, so the first one is actually for Ian. So is there something about um, open EHR resources and fire resources effectively duplicating? So are they duplicates or do they work together or discuss? Yeah, so there's, it's, a, it's a bit of a thing. So there are, I would say there are some, the critical fire resources, so the real key things, vaccinations, meds, allergies, condition, procedure. If we take these and, and it's a, a quite a few of the observations, there's actually very good alignment and that's not accidental i think it's partly that the just the world has matured a bit so people have got their ideas reasonably naturally aligned uh we know um graham Greve, the inventor of fire effectively when he was actually working on open air archetypes at the time that he was thinking of fire so you know he's been generous enough to say that he based quite a lot of the designs of his original key clinical profiles if you like on on the existing archetypes and we have done some joint modeling like the allergy archetype but also others we kind of cross you know we, we watch what they're doing and they watch what we're doing and we learn from each other in a perfect world we wouldn't be duplicating but it's really not as it's not as burdensome as that and there's a whole big space that goes beyond that where I think people are starting to understand that fire gets a little bit more tricky I mean it was designed to work with these high level uh, high value common arch uh, common models once it gets to if you like scales and scores, you know, end of life care plans, that sort of thing. Open air tends to do this a little bit better, we think, in fact, possibly a lot better. And we would love to be able to generate the fire models from archetypes. We think that's a good way of doing it. Anyway, I'll stop there. I could go on about this for a long time. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions, uh, either, uh, either from the panelists uh, oh, uh, hang on. So let me find you, Zadia. Ian, look at yeah. the Q&A slots. There's some questions there. Yeah, I'm getting there. Hang on a So, uh, Xavier, I believe you raised your hand. So do you want to ask your question? Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to read the chat window and <laughs> read the chat window, make sense of it, and also kind of deal with uh, all the other raised hand things at the same time. There's four quite clear points in the Q and A slot in the Q&A one, not the chat one, the Q&A. Uh, okay. So, uh, so the first point then, um, so is the point on, is the point on clustering codes is very similar to the control vocabulary problem where people don't author notes like this and why open EHR is a good bedfellow of SNOMED? I, sorry, Sandy, I don't really understand the question. I know I know Sandy quite well. Um, don't really quite understand. Maybe I, maybe I answer the last question that Sandy raised because I do understand that one. Um, 
it's it's the problem with penetration of both these systems and fire combination of funding and culture. Yes, it's a bit of both. Shouldn't we not just pick one for a few core issues? Well, no. Um, certainly, I, I I don't think any of these things are actually truly duplicating. So I don't know. Snowmed clearly is in a different space from fire and open air, but fire and open air are, are both working to achieve different ends. The, the the ultimate goal is still the same, but we need both. You know, uh, it's maybe you know long after I'm dead. Um, we will have one true solution that will cover all of these things, but we don't have it now, and I don't think we should waste energy trying to get it. I think if we we definitely could do with more funding on the information model side and indeed on the terminology side, um, but it's not. I, I I think it's I think being positive about the advantages and keeping a clear mind about when to use which technology is much better right now than ha trying to go for one true single um, you know solution. So, Alexander, I've taken you off mute if you want to ask any yeah. follow-up questions. Well, yes, I, I can explain the, uh, the first question a bit better. Um, ED systems often have this very bad symphony series of drop-downs that you have to go through. And when Peter was talking in the rheumatology sphere, I thought, this is why SNOMED just isn't, isn't there uh, compared to e you know, open EHR because there's a bit more um, semantic and language user friendliness with open EHR with respect to work as clinical practices as is done as opposed to as is conceptually and epistemologically and technically correct and I think that's the problem you're not going to get clinicians noting you know the, those particular relationships and drop downs unless you have some way of masking it and mapping it to something that's a bit broader like EHR that's the, the, what I was oh, really that's, saying I, I have to jump in no, clinicians are never going to do that. That's not part of what yeah. I'm suggesting at all. That this is what, um, for doing the data analysis, this is not for data entry, but for making the drop-down list, someone who's knowledgeable in this will make the drop-down list using a subsumption query to get the first list and then go through with their clinicians and say, are we missing anything here or are there some things you want us to take off? So subsumption is very helpful with the use of a person who understands it to make the initial drop-down list. But no, clinicians don't do that. Yeah, that's the thing. That's, that EHR was never part of there. the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so when the EHR is getting data in, I was talking about using the data after the data is in. I was not talking about getting data in at all. I'm talking about data analysis, not data entry. There are other, uh, for data entry, uh, you would not be doing this. For data entry, people who understand this might say, this is our, uh, like a person like me would maybe do subsumption and get a list of rheumatologic, uh, like let's say I did the autoimmune arthritis. I would get an actual list. Then I would give that list to my clinicians and say, pick the ones you want on the drop down list. And if I've missed one, tell me what you want. And then it would be a simple small drop down list and they would only see the drop down list. They would not see uh, the way that I went through SNOMED in one second and pulled out all of the autoimmune. So no, don't, don't confuse the data entry to the data analysis. This subsumption is strictly for data analysis, not data entry. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's, we have to remember that the primary purpose of the EHR is, you know, almost, you know, it's, there's four key processes, analysis, authoring, action of information, and access of information. I think really, you know, we have to really heavily consider the input side when we're, we're talking about, you know, ontologies and models and things like that. Obviously, I, I sit very nicely in defense of an interest with an interest, a question with an interest in informatics, but I'm very much a pragmatist. Uh, and that's why I think the link between Open EHR and SNOMED could be very, very productive uh, in the future because it could bridge that gap between authoring and analysis or uh, population health, as you were, you were illustrating. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want my earlier comments, but I'm saying deliberately a little bit provocative to, to be seen as negative. You know, it, it is a hugely power, powerful technology and Peter demonstrated that on the analytics side, but there are challenges 
in getting the data in in a consistent way. And particularly once you move away from, if you like, the, the traditional diagnostic models and you know, procedures and drugs into care pathways and the, if you like, the, the stuff that's less analytic, analytical in terms of um, sort of stuff that Peter was talking about, that's where we're into negotiation and subsumption is less powerful, it's less useful. Uh, and sometimes the, the kind of, you know, RDF proposed type way of looking at the world seems quite heavyweight, particularly as we're going to have to negotiate these things around and iterate the designs quite a bit until we get it right. So it's choose your tool, you know, and you know, absolutely what Peter was showing is fantastic. And I would want any any open air system I was <coughs> designing where people were licensed to use SNOMED, I would be wanting to maximize that facility as far as possible. So I, <clears throat> there are two questions from um, John Snyder, and I'll I'll actually answer both of them actually. <laughs> um, so how much are the numbers impact? I think there's a great opportunity. Ooh. Sorry? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so what John's asking is how much are the numbers impacted when you include mapping translation from ICD-10CM to SNOMED? The, so the demonstration which Peter did actually runs on SNOMED. If you're capturing data in ICD-10CM and then mapping that across to SNOMED, the queries actually run on SNOMED. But obviously the level of granularity is far more granular in SOMET than ICD-10CM, as with any other classification. Um, so the numbers, the resulting numbers, um, won't be impacted. Um, it depends on how much level of detail you want to go to. So the, the examples which Peter used, for example, um, the level of coding, the granularity of coding for COVID that we have in SOMET, is far greater than anything in 10 CM or ICD 10 in general. Um, so it will be impacted in a sense. Um, but that's more to do with the, the granularity of the two, the classification and terminology. Um, it's a tool using a combination of attribute relationship and transit closures. Um, yes, and that um, allows you to include primitive concepts as well as those model concepts. So you're not just picking up concepts which have that model you're also potentially picking up primitive concepts below as well so in the interest of time because we're at time now um so first of all i'd like to thank both speakers um and also thank the attendees for joining us um i'll be posting um the recording on our confluence uh, website um, if you have any further questions, you can either um, email me directly. Um, so my email is just igr at snowmed.org. Um, or if you don't want to speak to me personally via email, um, you can post any queries to info at snowmed.org. Um, but with that, I'd like to bring this uh, webinar to a close. And thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next month um, for another clinical webinar. So thank you, and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you.